And those are the questions we have to ask ourselves every day, every moment. Is my heart right with God? Do I have the meek, humble spirit He wants me to have? Am I showing His love to everybody? That's the question the song is asking. Is thy heart right with God?
we have come into your house this holy Sabbath day. A day that you have set aside, you have sanctified it, you have blessed it, you have held it for a special reason. For you have called us into a holy convocation to come together before your throne. This is what we have done. We've come expecting to hear your voice. So with the power of the Holy Spirit, under its inspiration we have come claiming the life and death of your Son to hear and be transformed by your word. Be with us, Lord. Strengthen us. That our faith be the faith that is a saving faith. Out of this world of sin, we pray in Jesus' name. trial of our faith. This is a mini-series that I'm going to do. It's going to be the trial of faith, the test of our faith, the patience of our faith. And today we are going to be looking at a perspective that maybe we have not been honest with ourselves in the past. For it's easy to be in a profession of faith. But as I have said before, a profession of faith will never gain salvation. Because a profession of faith is nothing. We must have a faith that will grow and be settled in truth, never to stagger, never to falter, no matter what comes our way. So to begin... Let us take a moment and understand what faith really is. We've all read God's Word saying in Hebrews 1, verse 1, Now faith is the substance of what? Things hoped for. Things hoped for the evidence of things what? Not seen. Not seen. But do we really understand what that verse is saying? In the Strong's Concordance, for the word faith, it is determined as being a persuasion, a credence, nor moral conviction of religious truth, especially reliance upon Christ for salvation. By extension, the system of religious gospel truth itself. This is what faith is. And it is the substance. So, so what's the substance? What does is, what is the word substance mean? Well, this was quite interesting to me because substance is not talking about the faith itself per se. But look at here. It says a setting under or support. So it's describing what faith is. Substance is describing what faith is going to do. A setting under, a support. What would we think as a, 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 a support? What's another word for su support? Foundation. Foundation. Thank you. It's very important that we have a right foundation. And so, with the understanding of substance meaning foundation... Well, so with these two word definitions, now we can read Hebrews 1, maybe this way. 11.1, 11, that's correct. Now, God's truth with persuasion under conviction as the foundational support of things hoped for and the evidence of things what? Not seen. Not seen. Does that give you a little bit of a new twist to the yeah. verse? You see, with this foundational present truth as our conviction, there are two experiences God's people will go through. Just two. 
This week we're going to talk about one. Next week we talk about the second. The first in light measure is now happening right now, but will soon intensify to heights not imagined. The second experience is even of greater magnitude than the first. Yet without the full, complete effectiveness of the first, the last will be impossible to survive. You've heard the saying, you can fool some people some of the time, but what? You can't fool everybody all the time. Well, that is extremely true with God. You may think you can fool God. You may think you can profess Christianity, but there's going to come a time when you will know your profession was really just a profession. And everyone else will know too. Like we were talking about in Sabbath school class with the kids, your sin will find you out. No matter how deep you cover it up. No matter how much you think it was in secret. The trial of our faith is what we're going to talk about today. This trial of our faith must be accomplished in our personal lives beginning here and right now. Without this trial of our faith, we cannot see heaven or experience eternal life. The fact is, it is of highest and greatest and most importance to our soul's salvation that we surround ourselves with this atmosphere of faith. But not just any kind of faith. A faith that is in harmony with heaven's principles and heaven's government. This is, a serious, is serious from two extremely important perspectives. First, in our personal salvation. Secondly, in our influence of our life on others. Written by a man who lived a long time ago, 200 years ago now, Richard Cecil. Never was there a man of deep piety who has not been brought into extremities, who has not been put into the fire, who has not been taught to say, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. If your Christian experience has not seen those moments where everything is against you for standing up for truth and you have not been tested and you have not been needing to say, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. You haven't been tested yet. Because each one of us will have that kind of a test. Note the powerful reality that unless we have an experience likened to Job, how can we presume to say our, test, our faith has seen trials and testing? Are we really truly desiring a test proven faith? Think about it. Do you desire a test proven faith? Or do you desire a profession? Because if your faith, you don't want to be tested, if you don't want to be challenged, if you don't want to be under scrutiny, then you're just enjoying a profession. You don't care about anything else. <clears throat> Note what the prophet of God said in 1895. We are accountable we are individually accountable for the influence that we exert and the consequences that we do not see as the result of our words 
and our actions. Signs of the Times, May 2, 1895. We are individually accountable for the influence we exert and the consequences we do not see. This is important. When we profess a high profession of present truth, if there is not a consistent atmosphere of living, heaven's faith shining of, from our influence, we must understand there are still rubbish of this world in control of our lives and not the Holy Spirit. In us, Jesus must dwell and shine forth for His glory, or we have no hope of glory in our life. When we see our lives that there is occasionally, or God forbid, constantly, our lie allowing circumstances that we face to resurrect the old nature of sin, we must surrender these moments to the power of God and allow victory in our lives that Jesus offers. That our lives will be effective for Him and not destructive. God has provided a reward greater than minds can ever imagine. But the reality is the test comes first. First Peter 1 Peter 1.4, we read in our scripture reading, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, is reserved in where? Heaven. Heaven, heaven for you. In heaven for me. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye re greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Verse 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes. In other words, seek the trial of your faith, not the riches of this world. There is not a thing in this world that is more valuable than your faith being tried. The things that you believe in, tried. There's not a single one of us that know anything of ourselves. We have to have our the things that we learn from the Bible, tried and tested, is it true? We can think it's true, but it's not true necessarily. Just because we think we read something in the Bible doesn't make it true. That's why we need our faith tried, tested. Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ Jesus. Let us never lose sight of this eternal fact. If we expect to partake in the eternal reward offered, we must experience the trial of our faith. I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. There's a big difference between a trial of our faith and a crop harvested of our sin's consequences. Amen. Far too often we take the consequences of our misdeeds as a trial of our faith. Oh, woe is me. Oh, I'm under so much trial. And when you find out that it's actually a bad decision made that caused that trial. The crop of our evil sown as the consequences earned. The trial of our faith is for our good. 
whether it be in persecutions, temptations, or service needed that is not desirable. I'll tell you a story of a young man who got married. He boy, he loved this woman and he decided he was going to get married. He married this woman. And it wasn't too long and a baby came along. Now that was a problem. He loved being married. But he hated the fact that now he's got a baby. Because you know why? Those diapers. They stunk. <laughs> and the stuff inside was really gross. And not only that, And see, they were poor. And it was a long time ago when, when disposable diapers were not the norm for everybody. True. True. And so it was a cough diaper with pins. Yes. And so you have to take the pins off. And sometimes those diapers didn't hold everything and it was just everywhere. <laughs> And then to clean it. Oh, a humble experience. You just, why can't God make a baby come out a little bigger so we don't have to do all that, you know? But it teaches humbleness. It teaches to be a servant. It teaches us Through the trials of life, joys come. You see, we're covered in sin. And God chose us to save us while we were yet sinners. He didn't tell us to go clean yourself up and then come. He said, come and I'm going to clean you up. That's why the Father, he, he may not enjoy cleaning that diaper, cleaning that bottom of the baby, he may, cleaning that all of the little crevices that can get so dirty. But he does because he loves. He doesn't tell the baby, now go get yourself clean. <laughs> that would be the height of stupidity, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. On this account, this count of trials, the believer should not shrink from situations, positions, or circumstances in which his faith may be tried, but should cheerfully embrace them as <coughs> opportunities where he may see the hand of God stretched out on his behalf and help and deliver him, whereby his faith will be what? Strengthened. Strengthened. There was a man in England who started out a small orphanage to take care of the street children. With almost no money he started, but he promised he would do one thing, he would never ask anyone for money. He would only ask his Father in heaven. There was a many a day he never came out of his office because he spent the entire day in prayer. Because that at times, he would have 300 children in his orphanage. And no food. 
no heat. But he would never ask a single person. He would plead for his father, provide, provide. His heavenly Father provided. You see, with temptations comes the trying of our faith. Temptations that are allowed by God to work in us patience. Victories gained brings quality into our lives. Temptations allowed by God are never to be used as excuses to lose our temper. Or to treat others poorly. For they too are God's children. We are God's children. They are God's children. Amen. And both are to be respected as God Himself. It is in this time of probation that we have been given that we are to be gently nurtured by our Heavenly Father into situations that will bring a greater quality to our characters for His glory. To show where we have not fully surrendered yet. We may think we are fully surrendered to Him. But in reality, there's probably not a single one of us here that are fully surrendered yet. God says you will be fully surrendered, fully purified, transformed. But we have got to seek His face. Constantly saying, Lord, show me where I am deficient before your face. Show me my faults. Help me to learn and understand that I may surrender everything to you. The trial of faith, on the contrary, develops increasingly the quantity and improving the quality. You see, we've got to have that, that trial of faith. Next week we're going to learn that the testing time, it does not provide any increasing of quality or quantity. The test doesn't. Only the trial. We're going to understand why next week. You see, when this work is done in our lives, it will express a living testimony. Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. Thou wilt keep him in what? Perfect peace. Perfect peace. Whose mind is stayed upon thee, on, on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. This principle of life must be firmly, resolutely maintained in our lives, not just once in a while, but every moment of our life that we breathe. We can hold a high profession of heaven-ordained truth, but if the truth does not transform our lives, it is valueless in the context of eternal salvation. Today we are learning from the context of the third angel's message of Revelation 14. This message we have seen comes at a time of worldwide strife. This message comes when the whole world desires unity and uniformity. But it's not based on the Word of God. The majority of professed Christians will base their life on thus saith the church. And the rest will say, thus saith the state. Both will seek to destroy every single human being who dare to live a life by thus saith the word of God. But in this environment, it is not after God's order to appear antagonistic to civil law and order. Amen. Just because the whole world says you have to worship on Sunday doesn't mean you need to be antagonistic and go mow your lawn on Sunday.
Did we get that? That would be what? Antagonistic. Ask him for trouble. That's correct. That's not appropriate. But use the time wisely. Go to your neighbor and say, can I pray with you? We should be doing that now. Can I share with you from what I've learned on this issue that is prominent today? Trust me, everybody's going to be talking about these laws when they start coming up. When these religious laws start being promoted. Remember, we have to understand the uniting of the apostate Protestant churches in the politics of this world will be a debated issue. It will not be something lightly concerned, concerning of people. They will be debated. And we need to know where we stand. And we can go to our neighbors and we can say, do you realize that this is a fulfillment of prophecy? Because most don't realize that it is. Most don't understand the re realization of what's really going to be happening in the future. We are to live and to move forward in the name of Christ and be an advocate for present truth that He has given for this time in the attitude of love and heart conviction. Note this quotation. Bible religion does not allow for a life of inactivity and idleness. One cannot believe for another or depend upon another's evidence. The individuality of one cannot be submerged in another. In other words, don't try to be like pastor. Don't try to be like the elder. Don't like, try to be like the Sabbath school teacher. You be yourself in Christ. Amen. Submerge yourself in the truth and God will transform your life to be something special no other person can be. God's work is a personal work. No one can be saved without earnest faith earnest work, faithful improvement of every God-given ability. And always remember, idleness is sin. Really, can we, can we really even conceive the fact that Christ didn't just sit around doing nothing all day? Do you, do you picture Christ ever being do, doing that? No. No. Never. Bible religion that has been designed by God will transform our lives. It will also bring into our lives a burning desire to share with others the love of Christ. This world being destroyed is going to be destroyed. And there are a lot of people that are just all they're doing is they're seeking nothing but self-glorification, self-preservation. Even in the, ma the majority of professed ministries, there's no spirit of service, only of gain. You see, when we are living a surrendered life, we will be placed into trials. For these trials is what eternal victories are forged. If you don't have the trials of faith that come from God, your faith will never be forged in eternal value. David, in Psalms 26, Verse 2 said, examine me, O Lord. Prove me. 
Try my reins and my heart. Have you prayed the prayer? Have you prayed that kind of a prayer to the Lord? And say, Father, prove me. Examine me. Oh. Can you have even a concept of what it means that for the fa our Heavenly Father to examine us? Are you afraid that He examined you? You see, it is in the trial of our faith that is and must be precious to us daily. The Lord will prove His people. Never forget this concept. Never forget that heaven is a prepared place for a what? Prepared people. Prepared people. Amen. Do you want salvation? Do you want the robe of Christ's righteousness? To wear this robe takes more than a profession and lip service. Lip service is an easy religion where everyone eventually gets saved. Lip service is being very knowledgeable in God's present truth and never applying it to have sin purged out and the old nature destroyed once and for all. Lip service is very active in doing good work in the church. But only when it's convenient or I desire to do it. In other words, sometimes we need to do the work of God that's like cleaning diapers. It's not desirable and it's not convenient. But we do it. Why? Because we love them. Because we love the baby and because we love Jesus. And we come and do the things that are even undesirable to do. Lip service. Living a lip serving Christianity is insubordination against God's eternal government. When trials come, we cannot complain, murmur of its effect in the way of our lives. It's not just a nice slogan or a spiritual saying that Christ is the head of the church. Here is the practical meaning. Growing up in Christ, our living head takes on new meaning when we see that it is from our spiritual head, Jesus Christ, who chooses what trials we need that our lives can be even have the possibility of being transformed for eternal good and eternal salvation. Note what Sister Thurston wrote in the Review and Herald placed there by the editor Uriah Smith. This is a beautiful, beautiful paragraph. And I first saw it this week and I'm going, wow. It is no prerogative of ours to be choosing our trials. But our particular, by our, by our peculiar privilege is to submit to God. To lie passive in His molding hand. That the language of our heart may all at all times be the same which meekly fell from our blessed Savior's lips when He said, Father, not My will, but Thine be done. Last Friday evening, I shared this with my wife, not last night, but a week ago. And you know how sometimes wives will say something and you go, wow, that was a, that was a moment. She said this, she said, think about it. If we could choose our trials, it would cease to be a trial. Right? Yep. If we go around and saying, this is where I need the trial at, it's not going to be a trial. 
A trial comes, you have no idea where it come from. Only it was allowed by your Father to, to purify you somewhere where you didn't know need purifying. A trial comes when you thought you got the house clean and it really isn't clean. A closet in your mind you thought was finished cleaning, it didn't get clean all the way. Can we say with all confidence that we have the mind of Christ as Paul admonishes? Jesus is our example, yet do we profess and live in opposite directions? Our Heavenly Father placed His Son not in the privileged home and lifestyle of the rich, but that of the poor. So that in childhood, Jesus, His character could, be, could grow and be constantly tried in a variety of ways and manners. It is in perfect submission that Jesus was able to offer His prayer of submission to His Father to His will facing Calvary. We must allow our minds to accept every trial for His glory and the perfecting of our lives in Him. God is faithful. To perform everything he has said he can do. Amen. Yes, yes. He will not hold back. He is faithful. Amen. Not only in allowing the trials to come, but the strength to have it, the endurance. Amen. Every individual that receives eternal life must be partakers of Christ and his sufferings before he can be a partaker in the glory of Christ. It is only by the trial of our faith that we can hope to gain spiritual strength. For it is through these experiences that God's people will learn to lean on Him. Lean on Him. Lean on Him. And nothing but our Father to lean on. Amen. Those who love their Redeemer will rejoice at every opportunity to share with Him in humiliation, shame, and reproach. Now I want to stop right here. That doesn't mean to go out and be antagonistic to someone just so that you can receive criticism back. No. That's not what's being said here. When you stand for truth for truth's sake, and I thus say it to the Lord, people are not going to like what you say. Because the majority of the world out there have misapplied the scriptures, misinterpreted prophecies, and they are, get angry when you say, no, that's not what God is saying. That's not God's will. The love they bear their Lord with their Lord makes suffering for His sake sweet. They know that if they suffer with Him, they will also reign with Him in His glory. Amen. This experience of suffering for Christ's sake is absolutely necessary to spiritual life of the Christian. Amen. There can be no true vital godliness without seasons of trial and grief. We are chosen in the furnace of affliction the trial of our faith is more precious than gold. Amen. You've heard that the bread and water of the righteous is sure. Correct? The scripture in the Bible, your bread and water is sure. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the bread and the water actually represent? Trials and affliction. Look it up in the Bible. You'll be surprised. That would make a lot of people surprised. What's that? That would make a lot of people surprised. You see, we think we think we read the verse and then we talk about 
bread and water, that means we're going to be nice and fat and sassy all the time. Yeah. All of our physical needs taken care of. That is not what it's talking about. Uh, not what it's talking about. But we must listen. God has sent us a stern warning in this third angel's message. And if when we suffer tribulation and with adversity we become impatient, what will the trial of our faith profit for eternity? Nothing. Remember this. If we suffer tribulation and adversity and become impatient, The trial of our faith profits for eternity nothing. The children of Israel when traversing the wilderness being led by God. Were they led by God? Yes. Oh yes they were. By a pillar of fire. The cloud of in the daytime. Pillar at night. Led by God. Murmured against God at the slightest difficulty. If we are so easily able to complain or be upset at the smallest things today with such great evidence in the Holy Scriptures, we will be just as surely failing as they fail. Yeah. Not only fail, but it received the same fate as they faced, seemed, and what they received. A whole generation died in the wilderness as an example of us if we are not try and receive the trial of faith, if we are not purified by that trial, we will die eternally. We've got to allow our characters to be purified now. Amen. If we keep the faith of Jesus alive. Revelation 14. Let's turn there. Revelation 14. Verse 12. This is actually the, the core of the next three sermons. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. Here are they that keep the faith of Jesus. Are you keeping the faith of Jesus? The verse says, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, but grammatically you can take out after the commas. And you can say, here are they that keep the faith of Jesus. You see, we have to have the faith of Jesus in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Controlling our lives now. It is only through this power and strength that we will be able to say, though He slay me, yet I'm going to trust in Him. The reality of the professed Christian do not say, well, it's not me. I'm in a present truth church. Every individual who claims the sacrifice of Christ and his life is a professed Christian. We do not know our own hearts like we think we know it. Our profession may be real, but our confession a presumption in the eyes of God. The hard reality from God's viewpoint is this. 
the vast majority of God's professed people in Christian world follow their own inclinations in a much greater degree of life's applications than following the lowly life of Christ in His steps to Calvary. But Paul keeps reminding us, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. You see, you can't follow your own inclinations and have the mind of Christ. We're not applying this verse practically in our lives when we are following our own inclinations and desires. When faced with desiring to know which way to go in life, first seek God's viewpoint and what will bring honor to God's name. When seeking employment, when seeking a relationship, when seeking anything in life, we must not follow our personal inclinations of desire, but that which will bring glory and honor to His name. We think far too often the trials that we suffer from are in fact not trials. But instead the harvesting of crops of wild oats sown from the inclinations and passions of our old nature and culture born within us from the ancestry of the third and fourth generation of doing not God's will. But notice this one thing. The harvest is coming. The harvest is coming. The great reaping time when you shall reap what you have sown. There will be no failure in the crop. Young people, remember, there's no crop failure in God's eyes. You sow wild oats, what are you going to get? Wild oats. You're going to get a lot of wild oats. The harvest is sure. Now is the sowing time. Now is the time to make efforts to be rich in good works ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for yourselves a good foundation against the time to come, that ye may lay hold on eternal life. The question is for each one of us today, right here, this very holy Sabbath day, what are we sowing? Is the faith that we possess and profess Really, a presumption? The trials that are allowed by God coming into our lives for the purpose of spiritual growth, mental growth, emotional growth. Yet if we are found complaining and murmuring and have a depressive attitude in our lives when brought into trial, how can we presume to be ready to enter into heavenly Canaan any more than the children of Israel standing on the banks of the Jordan River? You know, we've been given so much more than they were given. Yep. We have no excuse. None. Our will must be in complete harmony with our Heavenly Father and not just profession but reality. Just as Jesus was one with His Father and our Father in heaven, we must be one with Him also. Our Father has promised to do a work within us that is accomplished by our total, complete surrender to His will and purpose. Never forget it. It is the precious promises given by God that will never fail, even in the severest of trials. Faith 
living faith must be ours by the power of the divine connection made possible by the life and death of Jesus Christ. Our humanity is far too weak to gain even the easiest of victories that needs to be gained. Our faith untried will prove worthless when the final testing comes, which we talk about next week. No single, not a single person, no matter how much head knowledge you think you got, no matter how much you think you got memorized, without the constant indwelling of the Holy Spirit, who is, by God, bringing the divine power from within. You have no strength to gain the victories. Nothing. And man's wisdom is not God's wisdom. Amen. And all the knowledge you have is still man's, man's knowledge and man's wisdom unless the Holy Spirit's in there to help you and strengthen you. Daily our lives must have Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, dwelling in us. We must take Him in everything we do. Every step, every moment, having Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit guide our footsteps, guide our words, guide our thoughts heavenward that we may be transformed as we take Jesus with us daily saying prove me my God try me show me where in my life is not yet one with you this great day of atonement which will soon end there is a beginning and there is an ending to the day of atonement yes. it is at the end of the Day of Atonement that your faith is tested. May we be settled, fully persuaded in His love and character. Amen.
trust thee in all things. Amen. Let us kneel before him as we pray. Love be merciful and gracious Heavenly Father. Your people have been so insubordinate to you. For nigh more than a hundred years we have wandered around in the wilderness of this world and grown so much in love with this world, we don't even take the time for you. Still professing to be yours, we do so much that has nothing to do with you. And we need and confess this now. We lift ourselves up and say, Lord, please forgive us. Apply the blood of your Son to us that we may be covered and made righteous in your sight. That our sins may be blotted out and not our names. That when the testing time comes, it will show that we are fully clean and one with you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 